We today have developed a group of people. They've come out of our seminaries and some of our good seminaries. And they've gone off on this matter of election. And they see election as some little list that's God made of the people that are going to be saved. Can God make that list? I think he can. But I think that he doesn't fill that list until after you've made your choice. That list is not filled in until you've run your life span because you're a free moral agent. God made you that way. And the only condition is thirst. That's an area of free will. So this man say, well, I'm not thirsty. I don't need a Coca-Cola. I think I'll drive on. I want to make good time today. I'm not going to waste my time driving off. What's he doing? He's exercising a free will, friends. He's not a robot now being told to do what God wants him to do. He's exercising his free will. Now, I do not agree with you that there are going to be more people lost than saved. I think the greatest days of salvation are yet in the future. And I think that's the important thing, that God's going to win in this battle between right and wrong, light and darkness, truth and error. He's going to win. But the point is, even when you say that, there are many you're trying to say they were elected to be lost. No, they were given an invitation. Are you thirsty? If any man thirsts, let him come. And that's free will, friends. Whosoever will may come. Now, Spurgeon had it the best way that I know. Spurgeon said that if the Lord had put a yellow streak up and down the back of the elect, he wouldn't preach as he preached. Someone asked him that. He says, why, if I believe in election like you believe in election, I wouldn't preach like you do. He said, if God had put a yellow streak up and down the back of the elect, I wouldn't preach that way. I'd just go up and down the street lifting up shirt tails, finding out who's got the yellow streak. But you see, God didn't even put the yellow streak there, friend. It's whosoever will. And God has given you a free will. And your free will won't cause the universe to go to pieces. I can assure you that. And you won't upset God in the sense that he'll have to rearrange his plan and program. He's in that area of free will why he's able to let you move. May I say to you, we need an emphasis on that today. Now, I've taken more time than I should take on that, but I think that's probably one of the most important issues of the present hour because there's nothing that will stifle mission like that viewpoint. Now, I happen to know some folk, they were very close to me, that got in a little group that believed that. And it just absolutely destroyed their interest in missions. They weren't interested in getting anybody saved. Their little smug group was all together, and they're the elect. I say to you, what kind of idea do you have of God? Your God's big enough to give you a free will. And in that free will, you don't disturb an infinite God. But you've got a free will. Dr. McGee expands on the issue of the doctrine of election as he reads a letter from a listener in North Providence, Rhode Island. Here now is Dr. McGee as he reads the letter. I have studied the different views of election held by John Calvin, supralapsarian, L.S. Chafer, sublapsarian, and H.C. Thiessen, conditional election based on foreseen faith and Robert Shank's work, Elect in the Son. That's corporate and conditional election. Now, that immediately lets you know this question of election is not quite as simple as some seem to think that it is. We've steered away from all of the theological implications. This man hasn't. And I read, just to let you know how deep the question is, and some of the Letters we've been getting with somebody that's come up with some little simple answer to it. You haven't answered the question, of course, at all. Now, from the scriptures, it seems that men 
are responsible for believing or rejecting Jesus Christ. Men are treated as able to respond to the gospel. Father, the scripture clearly states God's will for all to be saved. 1 Timothy 2, 4. And that's a familiar scripture to us. Not wanting any to perish. 2 Peter 3, 9. Having no delight in the death of the wicked. Ezekiel 18, 23 to 32. Beyond this, all men are invited to salvation. Revelation 22, 17. The Spirit and the Bride say, Come, and whosoever will, let him come. Now, Jesus Christ, through his atonement, has provided salvation for all men. Not only the elect, and now he gives Romans 5, 18, John 3, 16, and all the familiar scriptures. The Apostle Paul appeals to men to be ye reconciled to God, 2 Corinthians 5, 20. In light of Christ's objective atonement, we are told in Titus 2.11 that God's grace has appeared for the salvation of all men, and seemingly 2 Corinthians 6, 1 and 2 establish the fact of prevenient grace given to all men which may be resisted. Now that is a very fine point, that it's given to man. There's a grace given to every man to either accept or to reject. Now, finally, in Romans 11, 5, and verse 7, and verses 17 to 24, verse 32, it appears at the very least that the election of grace is conditional upon a man's faith. In Romans 11, 7, Paul tells us the elect in Israel have obtained salvation, and the rest of non-elect were blinded. Yet of these non-elect are rest that are blinded, he dedicates himself to their salvation, Romans eleven fourteen, And of some of the branches, obviously individuals and not Israel corporately, which fail. Paul states in Romans eleven twenty three that they may yet be saved if they do not remain in unbelief. How can the doctrine of unconditional election be maintained in light of these scriptures. Could you please discuss this and give your viewpoint on the radio? Well, I discussed this on the radio and said the same thing, that there's only one condition of salvation, and that is faith. The thing that precedes that, I believe, is this work which you have called accurately prevenient grace. That is, that there comes to the heart of man a conviction and he's given free latitude and free will to make that decision, by the way. And after all, all Israel was savable, because Paul said, My heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. And he's not speaking of the corporate nation there, but of the individuals in the nation. They were all savable. And this idea that God has elected people to be lost, that is absolutely untrue. I like this. This man is a theologian, by the way, and it's nice to have one of them around every now and then.